Hi, everyone. Uh, I see that folks are joining the room. We just opened it up for folks. So I'm going to give it about a minute or so before we begin, uh, but we're thrilled that you're here and joining us. Well, welcome if you just joined the room. Uh, we are so glad that you're here and that you're joining us this afternoon. Uh, my name is Ben Adams. I'm the Associate Dean of Students and Director of New Student and Family Programs. And we're thrilled that you've joined us uh, for this afternoon's uh, webinar. And we host these webinars once a month throughout the spring just to keep you as families and parents connected to the experience of your student um, here at Duke. Uh, and we try to host a range of subjects over the course course of the semester so that you get a full exposure to what's going on. So if you've missed the previous ones, you can go to our YouTube website and check those out. Uh, we, we've hosted conversations this semester on the health resources available to Duke, including both mental health, but also physical health. We've included conversations on gender violence prevention and intervention, which is a new um, uh, uh, formalized office within uh, the Dean of Students office. We hosted a conversation with Coach Mike Elko last time, um, and we're saving the best for last with our uh, two of our deans, um, who are our deans of uh, the Pratt School of Engineering and the Trinity College of Arts and Sciences. They are the two deans that have oversight to the schools at Duke where there are undergraduates enrolled. Um, and the purpose of this conversation today is to, to really just engage uh, the two deans in conversation about the, the state of the undergraduate experience at Duke. As we wrap up this semester, we'll ask a few questions that are reflecting back on perhaps this year, but also as we as a lot of us in, in higher ed know, we begin to look to the future pretty pretty early on. And so many of us are already looking to the fall and to future years as well. So we'll probably get a preview of things to come. Just to, to, before I introduce our, our two guests, I do want to just take a second to, to let you know that we are recording this. Again, we will post it on the website um, and on our YouTube page after we are finished. Uh, but I also want to let you know that we're going to be um, op opening up to questions uh, at the end of the conversation. And so we expect this will last about 45 minutes or so. We'll save some of those questions for the end um, and we'll make sure that you have time to, to hear back from them the questions that you'd love answered. So let me just take a second to introduce um, our two guests. Um, uh, the two uh, deans that we have with us today, again, are Dean Jerry Lynch, who is the Dean of the Pratt School of Engineering. Um, Dean Lynch has been with us for a, a few years now um, and has ca came to us as the Vinick. Uh, Dean of Engineering. We're thrilled to have him. Um, he Again, he oversees uh, the school and all of its efforts, both as undergraduate and graduate, um, The fac obviously engaging the faculty as well. Um, and so we welcome you, Dean Lynch, to the conversation. Thank you. Um, we, al we also have with us uh, Dean Gary Bennett. Uh, Dean Bennett was recently named the Dean of Trinity College of Arts and Sciences. Um, he's a professor in uh, neurology and neuroscience, uh, or excuse, excuse me, neuroscience and psychology. Uh, global Health and Medicine and Nursing, um, and he has uh, been at Duke for some time, transitioning from a previous position as the Dean of Undergraduate Education, and so he has seen it kind of from both sides, both from the overall school's point of view, but also from the undergraduate experience as well. So thanks for joining us, Dean Bennett. We're thrilled to have you. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. So let me just start off with a general question to, to ask both of you, and I'll let either of you chime in first. Um, so Duke uh, obviously prides itself on being a place with a liberal arts education. And I'm just wondering from your vantage point, um, what do you see as the value of a liberal arts education today? Go ahead, Gary. <laughs> well, I'll start. I'll start by saying um, we're very polite here at Duke, there, as you can as you can just see. Uh, but look, I I think it's common at institutions like ours uh, for our students to uh, express interest in changing the world. Uh, but you know, before our students change the world, they need to understand it, and I think that's especially true at this moment in time with uh, the polarization, misinformation, the rapid advancements in technology, all of these things. Um, are forcing folks who hope to be leaders of, of our country and our globe to really understand the 
world and its complexity. And that's what a liberal arts education helps you to do. It helps you to figure out both how to solve problems, but importantly, what problems to solve and, um, and, and what questions to ask. We're preparing a group of students who will think critically, who are comfortable engaging people whose backgrounds, whose opinions, whose politics may differ from their own. Um, we're giving them a set of skills to understand the world and their place in it. Um, and the hope is that uh, through this kind of work, we're preparing a group of folks who can go off into the world and take on some of our most vexing challenges. Yeah, and I may add to that, one of the, the mottos that we have in engineering here at Duke is in service to society. And playing off of what uh, Dean Bennett just shared, engineers that are being prepared to go out and actually leave their mark on society and service to society need to be able to think more broadly about the problems that they're tackling. Uh, traditionally, engineering education focuses on technical competencies that are born in the sciences um, and applying those uh, bodies of knowledge to solve real world problems. But the problems that our graduates are facing today are so complex and so global in scale. They have to have a much broader perspective that is built upon that technical competency, but they have to understand the non-technical dimensions of the solutions and how they're going to deploy them. And that's where liberal arts education here at Duke is so valuable to our engineering students is that they get that technical competency to be able to actually truly solve these problems with technology and solutions, but have the liberal arts education understand how, when they go to implement those solutions, how they get implemented. Think about the finance of the solution, questions around the, eth the ethics of a solution or the equity, who's benefiting from those solutions. To ask and to answer those questions, one needs to have had broad exposure to liberal arts. And from my perspective as Dean of Engineering, that's the beauty of this union between Trinity Arts and Science and the Press School of Engineering, that our undergrads will get that broad exposure both to liberal arts and engineering. That's great. I'm, uh, you know, I, as a as a Duke student, I'm a Duke grad and, and, and majored in public policy, but obviously Duke's curriculum was such that it, it opens up so many opportunities for you to take classes in a wide range of things and encourages you, pushes you out of your field constantly. Um, I'm wondering, you know, if you all might reflect, you know, we heard from you, Dean Lynch, a little bit about what um, the perhaps what Pratt School of Engineering does and lives that how how it lives out that liberal arts education. Dean Bennett, I'm wondering if you might illuminate or, or add a little bit more about how you see Trinity doing that um, well um, in terms of living out the liberal arts education. Yeah, well, you know, I, I think that the thing I get most excited about when I think about the Trinity and what happens in our classrooms is that our, our students uh, come here and have the best of both worlds. They encounter absolutely world-class uh, path-breaking scholars who are, are, are quite literally um, you know, innovating, they're creating, they're breaking grounds in their fields. Um, they're world-class. They're also people who enjoy teaching undergraduates. And mm. I think if you compare us to other institutions, um, you will often find uh, institutions where there is a commitment to undergraduate education. In some places, you'll find absolutely world-class scholars. I think Duke has the distinction of, of having both of those in the same people. And it's a very, very exciting proposition for, for our students and for our entire community. Um, it's the case that on any given day, you will find our faculty not only interacting uh, with their students in the classroom, um, but they can also flunch their their student, their their professor. So that is to say, a student can take a faculty member out for lunch. Um, it's absolutely wonderful. They engage deeply in our office hours. They can conduct research or or create new art with them under their direction. Um, it's not the case that at all universities faculty are as deeply involved with uh, undergraduates as they are at Duke. And I think that's one of the things that distinguishes us. us. Yeah. Awesome. What about you, Dean Lynch? How, what what is it that um, do you think that Pratt does particularly well? Um, or perhaps a part of the curriculum or the experience that you're particularly proud of as the dean? Yeah, so an area that we're an innovator in is what we would call experiential learning. Uh, mm. So learning by doing and using that as a way to align what we're trying to teach these young um, soon to be professionals, aligning what we teach with their purpose, uh, what they're excited about, the type of um, you know places where they want to be solution providers and leave their mark on the world. So we have a curriculum at the undergraduate level that is really based on that hands-on learning in labs and using design as a common theme across the curriculum. So one area that uh, we essentially will give students early exposure to is, 
is design incline inflected uh, processes. So we have our first year design course that all of our incoming engineers will take first semester freshman year. And it's teams of four to five students uh, that work with a client that's been sourced from our community, uh, maybe from industry, it could even be from our campus, and work on a project to understand what is design, how do you engineer design solutions, and how do you present that and work with different stakeholders to actually deliver that solution that meets those needs. That's one example of that experiential learning, but there's many examples that even go beyond that first year that really define what a Pratt, a Pratt engineer's experience is. It'll be around that hands-on learning. That's critical. And, and, and great that even in, in year one, you're already introducing to that real life problem solving. I think that sometimes it can be, it can feel so hypothetical, so the conversations in certain areas, which are great because we should be thinking um, uh, outside the box. Sometimes that's what sparks great ideas is thinking beyond what is necessarily in front of us. But being able to find real world solutions is, yeah. is critical as well. And, and particularly for engineering, because engineering, you do have a lot of basic science and math you have to take in the first two years. It's just foundational knowledge to the field that sometimes students don't understand why that material is important. Mm. And they have to mm. wait until their sophomores or juniors before they're really seeing what is the identity of the engineer? What are they going to do professionally? So by doing this in the first semester, they try on that identity engineer and it reaffirms why they're about to embark on this journey and go through the curriculum that we have that's essential to their long-term success. But they're able to see it in a different set of eyes and they get more excited about that material. And mm -hmm. that's why that first year design course is so critical. Yeah, that's exciting. I, I actually didn't realize that that was a central part of the Pratt experience uh, was that first uh, that design course. Uh, Dean Bennett, what 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 about you? What's the thing that uh, that you pride yourself on in terms of the, the trendy curriculum itself? Um, yeah, well, I'd, I'd say, you know, um, I, I am passionate about students' involvement in, in undergraduate research. So that is working with a faculty member in a scholarly area on a project, on an initiative um, that's of interest often to the faculty member and, and usually becomes pretty you know, of interest to the student as well. And um, this is a place, it's, it's frankly one of the reasons I moved to Duke as a faculty member. I was at a at a school of public health before I came back to Duke, and one of the reasons I moved here is that we have a both the tradition uh, of of really involving undergraduates deeply in the conduct of our research, and that is just a tremendously exciting undertaking, both for a faculty member um, who gets the benefit of having extremely smart people working working with them every day, um, and to be perfectly frank, my undergrads keep me on my toes all the time, um, but it's also the case that it's really it's really exciting for for our undergrads as well to really see the work happening in just the same way that Jerry was mentioning a moment ago. One of the things I always found interesting, again, as a student, was the, the fact that, you know, you have this, the labs kind of all surrounding, even though even the hard science labs kind of surrounding East Campus. I mean, like they, they are right there within easy walking distance, whereas large uni universities, you have to take a bus across all different places to get to the other side. But Duke's Office of Undergraduate Research is here, our, our exposure to our med school is here, our exposure to all the labs um, in Pratt, um, LSRC, those areas are all within a short walking distance, which I think proximity matters um, to the undergraduate experience, um, the locations of these opportunities. It's critical. true. I mean, we, we often internally, we often say that, that Duke has pretty low walls, both literally and figuratively. Right. And that's that right. is to say that you can walk, you can get from the medical school all the way to the business school, um, you know, in about 15 minutes of, of walking, or at least it takes me 15 minutes to, to get that to get it all the way across campus. Um, but but really, like figuratively, our students can get involved in research in all of those places, and they are heavily involved. And that is, um, it's just a very distinctive part of the of the Duke experience. That's right. That's right. So, I'm going to pivot just a, a little bit because I know that I mentioned in your introductions that both of you are are relatively new to your roles here at Duke. Uh, maybe not Duke, but relatively new to the roles at Duke. Dean Lynch, you're in your third semester at Duke. Um, Dean Bennett, you're you've been here for a number of years, but you entered this role in in February. Um, can you tell us a little bit about uh, your vision for Pratt, your vision for Trinity, respectively, and kind of where where we're heading in the two schools? Yeah, so maybe I'll take the first shot at that. Sure. Um, one area where we're really excited about innovating at the undergraduate level in our curriculum is trying to be very thoughtful about how that curriculum is providing students with a stronger sense of purpose. 
uh, we're seeing a, a generation of students coming into our programs that are very idealistic. Uh, they have a sense of the type of areas where they want to have impact professionally and are looking for experiences that are going to align with that sense of purpose. So we're thinking about how do we take the engineering subject matter that can be very technical and sometimes feel isolated from real world problems and contextualize it in the type of problems that students want to solve. So that's aligning the curriculum with their purpose. We're also very focused on ensuring that students have a very strong sense of agency as well. Uh, they provided the tools, the experiences, and the mentoring uh, that is going to empower them to explore, be curious, learn, and to essentially give them a sense of agency as they leave our campus to become young professionals, that they really can take on these complex challenges and not be afraid by that. One of the areas where we do see students struggle is recognizing that many of our students coming in are so successful, so well qualified, if you will, to come to Duke, they might not have failed yet in their lives. So we're thinking about how to gently allow for students to fail in our curriculum to give them a sense of grit or resilience, which is really important because if we think about the type of problems that students are seeking to solve, whether it's climate change or uh, food security, cybersecurity, what have you, these are so complex it's likely that future generations are going to fail before they'll succeed. They have to have that grit. So we're looking at our curriculum and the experiences students have as they journey through that curriculum, both in the curricular and the co-curricular spaces, about how everything aligns with purpose, agency, and grit. At the same time, we want our students to be highly entrepreneurial and very innovative. So looking at the co-curricular opportunities that our students have to cultivate that spirit of innovation and entrepreneurship, seeing that as the hallmarks of what will define success for our students leaving the program. Yeah, and, and and indeed, so so uh, Dean Lynch has been in his role for for three semesters. I've been in my, my mind for about three months, and so <laughs> we, we, I, uh, I I certainly have a lot of ideas about where where I hope Trinity will be going over the next couple of years. But just to give you just to give you a few few thoughts, I you know actually on my way uh, into the office about an hour ago, I was walking down the hallway and I, I encountered a couple of students sitting um, next to one another, kind of busily chatting with one another in hushed tones in front of some computers. And as I want to do, I stopped to say hi and ask them what they were doing. Um, and it turns out that they were getting ready to walk into the adjoining room to be able to defend their honors theses. Um, so it's, you know, it's that time of year. And these two seniors had been working over the course of the year under the direction of a faculty member to put together these projects. And of course, you know, I asked them what they were working on. And it felt like 30 minutes later, I got a got a pretty good understanding because they really knew their stuff, right? It's a very common complex, really interesting series of, of projects. And, um, and like that is magic, right? Like for the for this generation of students who, uh, to Dean Lynch's point, have not had experience failing um, largely and academically, um, and and for whom exploration is often very challenging, right? They have learned that they are going to knock it out of the park, and they are often going to follow a path that allows them to be able to maximize the su their success. Getting involved in research of that type, where they really have to learn an issue and its complexity, it's it's perfectly. Super Suited for this generation of students, they can they can fail in ways that where there's a safety net. They can learn to be able to explore, and they can use their absolutely stellar intellects in ways that are in the service of a of, of a really interesting final product. And so we're really we want to double down on undergraduate research and get its students as involved as possible because we just think it's it's a it's a perfect kind of differentiating experience for Trinity College, but it's also the right thing to do for this generation of young learners. Um, we're also very very interested in trying to find ways of helping our students to be able to learn how the skills of having tough conversations across areas of difference. Um, this is a, as a moment in time when institutions like ours are diverse by every definition, uh, than that more diverse than they've ever been. And um, it's the perfect training ground for learning how to, how to have these difficult conversations, which we think will position our students to be able to move into the leadership positions uh, that, that, frankly, our country needs. 
And then I, I think the last thing is, you know, we've been giving a, a long a thought over the last couple of years to the idea of, of, of Jerry was mentioning earlier, a really interesting, his first year design course. And we similarly have been attending to those initial courses that our students take. They're so important in setting the stage for helping our students to feel confident, giving them the initial set of skills, really giving them a good introduction to, to areas to learn if they want to go deeper. Um, uh, and, and if they do, we really want them to be excited about these, these areas. So we're given a good look at what we call our gateway courses, those initial classes in, in, our, in our disciplines, and making sure that they are as robust, um, as exciting, uh, as, as feature-rich as they can be, so that they're not weed-out courses that so many of us experienced um, if we had the luxury of going to college, but they really are courses that are inviting and that, um, that help our students to get a, a taste of what these disciplines actually can do. Can I ask, a, I'm going to ask a follow-up question for both of you, because we, we're getting already some questions in the chat, and, and while we may save some of them for the end, one of them is, is particularly relevant to what we're talking about, which is research. Um, and, and I'm wondering if the two of you might be able to share a little bit about um, how some of your students can get involved in research pretty early on. Like, what's the, what, is the, what is the advice that you might give to an undergraduate who knows they want to do research, but maybe not know of how to kind of break the ice either with a professor, faculty, or just department or subject area. Um, uh, Dean Bennett, why don't you start and then we'll let uh, Dean Lynch follow up. Sure. So, you know, this is this is actually one of the areas that we're we're thinking the most about. Um, uh, in my world, we call this the discovery function. So you have lots and lots, anytime you have lots of opportunity, one of the most challenging things is to figure out how do you discover um, which path with your direction? Like how do you discover what options are available to you and, and help to give you some insight into which direction you should follow? So we're thinking a lot about that. I'll give you two, there are two examples um, that I think are can be most helpful for, for students. The first is the tried and true through, um, you know, informal cold call email to a faculty member whose interests correspond with those of a student. And it's a it's a time tested strategy. It's not one I love because it doesn't necessarily um, uh, speak to students who have who maybe a little introverted or who, who may have some concerns about reaching out to a given faculty member. But I often tell students you know, and go to a faculty member's office hours, invite them for a lunch, ask them what they do. And if you're interested, ask if there are opportunities in the lab. Um, the, the more structured opportunities that we have for students to get involved in, in research, I think are very exciting. There is a platform uh, we worked on called Muser, um, and Muser involves a series of rounds. So over, over the course of an academic year, several times over the academic year, a student can go on to Muser. It's an online platform. Um, they can discover a range of interesting research topics, and they can express their interest in being involved in these research projects. And when they do that, they do that in a way that is um, where they provide their, their interest and kind of their credentials, a little brief kind of resume sort of thing. And then they select some ideas and then the faculty members select an idea and there's a matching process that happens behind the scenes and students find out where they get matched and faculty find out who they match with. And, um, and it's a really, really successful way to both find interesting research uh, opportunities, but also engage with them in ways that I think can, can be very comfortable for this generation of students. Yeah, so just to follow up on that, um, I agree that there's both the formal mechanism, Mooser's uh, our formal way of providing those opportunities to students and making them widely available to all students, and then the informal. And the benefit of the informal is, is that you can potentially tailor the type of research you want to do based on the faculty member that you're engaging. And I agree with Gary, just approaching the faculty, engaging the faculty um is a good way to go if you have very tailored interests and those interests aren't necessarily manifest in the different projects that are being posted on Mooser. but i would put one word of caution and that is is to wait until the student is truly ready to do research um not to squander that opportunity these are very special opportunities that really can broaden the perspective of the student they can get so much out of it not only learning about a state-of-the-art topic but really understanding what does it mean to do research? How do you do research? And use that as part of their intellectual growth as students here to wait until that student is truly motivated to do it and is willing to commit themselves to that opportunity. So it's not just about finding the opportunity. It's also about timing the opportunity as well. Uh, now, students have done it as early as that first year as freshmen and some wait until they're seniors. But here in engineering, roughly 60 to 70 percent of our graduating class has done research at some point through those four years.
But the ones that do it when they're truly motivated to deeply engage in a topic and are willing to put the time, they will get the most out of that experience. So, so just being thoughtful a little bit about the timing of it is important as much as how do you get the opportunity. That's, that's great advice, I, I think, uh, for, for parents as they continue to try to support their child from afar. Sometimes it's um, some kids come in kind of ready to go. Students are ready to go and ambitious and everything, but perhaps the timing might not be there in the first first semester. And it just well, that, that, into the well, really, the, But the challenge really is, is that uh, one of the most beautiful things about coming to Duke is you have so many opportunities to grow yeah. outside the classroom. The number right. of co-curricular opportunities you have are just, they're unlimited. Right. And students can't do it all. And I think you have to give it a little bit of thought before you start engaging about ensuring that what you take on, you can truly learn from and grow as part of it, not overdo it, but mm -hmm. also timing it, you know, waiting maybe a little bit to do research a little bit later affords the opportunity to do co-curricular opportunities in the first year and the second year that it may be a little bit more about building your social network in concert with expanding exposure to a different topic. Mm -hmm. uh, so there's just so much here that I think students should give some thought as they come through, seek out advice and mentoring from faculty about how to help down select mm -hmm. to what may be the, the best aligned opportunity for them. But be thoughtful that you could, there's so much to do here, but you can't do it all. That's right. That's great. Well, that, that's actually a great segue to the kind of the next question, the next topic, which is, which is Duke students um, and, and kind of where they are, but also, you know, your experience, um, both as, as faculty in other places, and you've worked at other places before. I'm wondering from your vantage point now, being uh, the leaders of the two undergraduate schools at Duke, what makes a Duke student a Duke student from where you sit? It's, it's hard to generalize. The, the beauty mm -hmm. of the Duke student body is that it is incredibly diverse, right? And it's not just their identity, it's their personalities, uh, what they enjoy doing or not enjoy doing. So it's hard to generalize. But I, I will say that there are some common features across the entire student body. And the one that I enjoy the most is, is the sense of responsibility about their own education and their own growth here on campus. I've not seen that the previous institutions I've been at. A great example of that is students running house courses, saying, hey, there's an area I'm really interested in. Myself, my friends, we feel that this is an area we'd like to learn more about, engage academics across our community to help us with this learning process. They create their own house courses. Uh, you just don't see that in many other institutions where students are so empowered to take control of their own education and the way that they want to grow that they do that but they're afforded that opportunity here. And I think that illustrates their passion, um, their you know, curiosity and their responsibility around themselves and how they contribute back to the larger student body mm -hmm. here. Yeah. I, um, I, so so on, on, on Friday, we had an event called uh, Bricks to Stone, which is um, where we were welcoming. And you know, I, I also note for the audience that, that Ben ran this program beautifully. <laughs> And um, and it was a it's a program where we are welcoming students from their East Campus uh, houses into their new quads on on West Campus, and um, there's a lovely ceremony. And at the ceremony, um, one of the student hosts uh, invited students in the audience to come up to the stage randomly and to share their impressions of their experience at Duke thus far, which has you know been I guess nine months or so. And uh, one of the one of the young people ran up to the stage and he grabs the microphone and he says, you know, like, I, I absolutely love this place. I'm, you know, I'm, I love it. I love Duke basketball. And and, and, I, and I, it's, it's everything. But the only thing I knew about Duke, Duke basketball before I started was that there was a ball and there was something like eight or 10 people on the court. And now I'm like, you know, I'm loving Duke basketball. And he jumps on the stage and all the kids are screaming and he runs off the stage. And I just I mean, I was laughing because there's a way of looking at someone saying that and thinking, you know, the Duke students are really into Duke basketball. That is true. It's also the case that our community is one that invites people to come in and 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 just find these these new passions, right? Like it's just 
being part of this community is about, it's a lot about spirit. I often tell tour groups when they're walking around campus to, to, while they're going on campus tours, they should count the number of students they encounter who are wearing the paraphernalia of their school. And you always will find that Duke students are wearing more Duke stuff uh, than anybody else. And it was reflected by this student going up on stage and saying, well, I knew nothing about this, but the Duke community makes it easy for me to skill up in my basketball and then just feel a part of this community in a way that, that perhaps they could never have imagined. Imagine. That's a very, it's very, very special. And for this generation, again, of students who have learned how to be extraordinary academic beings, um, they have intellects, again, off the charts. The fact that they are learning in this community how to round out their unbelievably robust intellects with, with strong social engagement with students from all over the world who share different opinions and different perspectives. It is just, it's a wonderful thing. And, and I think it does, it happens at other institutions, but I think the way it manifests itself at Duke is, is special and it shows uh, in, the, in the spirit of these students. I wish right now I could turn my camera around and point it out the window because I have the luxury of being able to look out on the Able Quad and you just see legions of students walking around who are enjoying the place. Um, and so the, the kids are gonna be okay. And uh, and and I think it's especially true here at Duke, uh, where where I just think it's just a very exciting and uh, place for to be a to be a young person. Yeah, and I may go one step further, and and it's for students to be very deliberate about partaking in those social yeah. occasions mm -hmm. and where they're going to mm -hmm. forge those bonds. Because one thing that is really distinct about Duke is when you know myself and Gary and others go out and we travel and we meet alumni, the love and the passion for the institution and how generous they are to support this institution, that actually starts on campus. Right. And it's part of that social fabric that you become part of, that students should lean in on that, take advantage of it. That really is one of the most powerful features of the experience here is that you're forging these bonds that are gonna carry through life and are gonna help you professionally, socially. It's really, really special. So basketball is a great illustration of that but it's much, much deeper than mm. basketball. But it is such a critical part of enjoying the Duke experience and really getting the most out of it. Mm. That's great. The, the, the energy is definitely high on campus. I think the energy and the excitement um, <laughs> is, is, is high uh, and, and the passion overflows. I mean, it, obviously it, it, can, it can be boosted by athletics and the school spirit, but it, but it is felt in the labs, in the classrooms, across campus, whatever the activity du jour is, um, people bring energy to it, I think, because you can't help but get swept up by the energy of this place. Um, and we're a small, small, small campus, so it's very right. concentrated, you know, yep. so it's, it's, yeah. it's very concentrated. It's amazing. <laughs> Yeah, That's it's awesome. it's very concentrated at times. I it, it's it's important point you make, Ben. Like I tell people, like if you if if at like three a.m. on a Saturday night, you're on you go in the library, you'll see our students there studying, right? Like there right. is a way in which um, this is a this is a place where students deeply engage in pretty much all aspects of their of their experience here, and it and it just makes for a very interesting very interesting context. I'd say you know we study our students in some at some in some detail, so I can tell you uh, that on the back. And the data pretty strongly suggests that our students are doing are doing pretty well and, and certainly yeah. doing uh, far better than they were doing in the pandemic. We had a very robust bounce back. Um, but one of the things I'm proudest of right now is that our students' sense of belonging is higher than it's ever been in, in, our, in the history that we've been measuring and uh, during the time that we've been measuring this. And, and that may seem a little fluffy, but, but sense of belonging is one of the best predictors of students' mental health and of their academic performance. Mm -hmm. If you feel like you're in a place, the place you should be, feel a good fit. Um, then you are likely to perform and to, and to be healthier. And um, so I'm, I'm very, very pleased uh, that we're, we are where we are right now. Yeah. Let's, um, let, me, let me ask a couple uh, of questions too that may seem like they're, they're one-offs, but I'm, I'm interested, just going to rattle a couple of them. Uh, is there a class um, or perhaps let me, let me broaden it across your experience, um, that you would consider to be like on your bucket list. If you were a Duke student, is there something that you think every Duke student should go through? Um, or maybe that's a class, maybe that's an experience, um, just as a, as a guidance for, for, for those four years. I mean, like, what, what would you share? What would you do? What's on your bucket list? I'm a little biased. So I would say yeah. for your design, uh, Good. but uh, but aside from that, it, there, there is a course I wish I could have taken as a student. It's a, a campus-wide course that we introduced this year. We'll continue next year, and it's called Let's Talk About Climate. 
Hmm. And it's an interdisciplinary course that brings uh, scholars from across the entirety of the institution that have different perspectives and different um, sort of skills and professions that can be applied to climate change to talk about climate change and what does it mean to us as a society. Hmm. Um, I, I wish I could have had a course like that when I was a student. Mm. That is such a rich way to look at such a pressing and a problem that students are deeply passionate about, but get that multidimensionality and multidisciplinarity uh, across this course. Fantastic. Mm. Jerry stole my course. That <laughs> said that too. <laughs> yeah. that's, per that's perfect. Um, I would also say that uh, we have a we have a, a series called Th Transformative Ideas, and these are a series of courses that are focused on our second year students, and they're often based in the humanities, and they're really on the most important ideas, right? Like so, uh, we have classes called the Good Life. We have medicine and human flourishing. There's one called How to Rule the World. Um, taking courses in in these areas just will allow students, I think, to stretch their brains and direct where they, they haven't had an opportunity to pre previously. And again, learn, learn how to wrestle with the most important ideas of our time. Mm -hmm. um, but frankly, I think taking any course that's completely opposite, that's a part, that's a, that's, you know, a departure from, from what our students have, have been doing is, is something, is what they should do. I think any of us who've been to college probably wish we had taken, uh, you know, four or five courses that were completely outside of our, of our, of our primary area of interest. And I, that would be my best advice for our students today. Yeah. Two points to follow up. One, you all will be proud because um, my my academic advisee that I met with last week, uh, he registered for both. Uh, let's talk about climate change and the good life. So he's in well, both. Uh, so both of your preferred deal. courses. <laughs> the, the second thing, too, I think is important to just note is that similar to a point, Dean Lynch, that you made earlier is that there's so much to do that I can almost guarantee you that that students will be discovering fields and departments well into their junior and senior year that they probably wish they had learned a little bit more about maybe earlier on and taking more courses. Um, it's just the nature of a place like this. I mean, you, you really do, you major in things, you sample things, but a lot of our students are double majoring or doing major minor certificate or major minor minor that they're collaborating because they have diverse interests um, and they seem unrelated, but it's the beauty of that first question that we asked, the liberal arts education of saying, you know, there's, there's a balance of, of practical skills that you can build, but also kind of more theoretical um, interest. And so it's, it's a beautiful place to explore. L last question I'm going to ask you before I turn to the Q and a is, um, that I have for you is you've, you've made a career out of supporting 18 to 22 year olds. Uh, that's, that's what you do. Um, uh, uh, and, and while our families know their students best, um, they may not know this age as well or as long as you have. So I'm wondering what advice might you have to parents and family members um, as they continue to partner in their students' academic journey at this stage of life. You want to go first, Gary? Probably should, because I'll, I'll spend the rest of the afternoon talking about this. So you, you can cut me off here in a minute. Um, I'd, I'd say um, that there's pretty good data that in the early 90s, the amount of time that families, uh, parents started spending with their kids increased dramatically. It actually started before the smartphone generation and corresponded to some degree, we think, with the uh, rise in selectivity for most elite institutions. So that is a long, that's a, that's a long way of saying that I suspect many of you are, have been spending a lot of time with your students in the, in the run up to their, their college matriculation. And our own data would suggest you spend a lot of time with your students now, um, particularly via social media and texting. And that's really different than the ways that I think many of us experienced engaging with our parents in, in years past. Uh, I happen to think it's wonderful that uh, the parents are engaged and as close to their students today as they are. And, but there's one, one piece of advice, and this is probably more for parents than it is actually for students. And, and that is, we see time and time again, um, that because of the of the close relationships that our students often have with their parents, our parents often hear a lot of the challenges that students are experiencing. Um, that 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 those relationships make you their counselor, their support person, their advisor, their surrogate therapist from time to time, and you're going to hear a lot of those a lot of those challenges. So my suggestion to you is that when you hear some of these things from your student, listen, take a pause, and then ask them to tell you about the good things. 
I promise you there's a long, long, long list, but um, you hearing some of those challenges, right, is, I think is reflective of the strength of your relationship. Take, take a pause, ask them to tell you the good things and, um, and then reinforce those, those good things that your students are, are experiencing. Stay out of the details of their experience, but like reinforce their engagement with, with this place and their, their interest in exploring and the opportunities that they're taking that are, that are kind of new paths and new directions. Um, encourage them to sleep. And, uh, and, and again, just, just ask me to tell you some of the good things. I think you'll, I think you'll like what you hear. And I would also say, um, encourage your students to take a wide view of all these opportunities, not to necessarily just get focused on what they've come here to study as their major, but really grow as much as they can in these four years. It's such a special moment. You don't get a moment like this again in your life. Uh, allow the students to freely explore. Uh, don't over constrain them saying, well, gee, is that going to lead to a good paying job? If they're passionate about it, they will be successful, but let them explore in this period in time. And, and that includes not just the type of courses they take, but those co-curricular opportunities. It's so integral to the growth that they're going to have here in those four years. Encourage them to partake in that. Um, you know, don't overdo it, but partake. Don't not partake in that. It's such a critical, critical part of the experience. Well, thanks for answering those questions. Um, those are the questions that I have. So I'm going to turn our attention to the questions that the parents uh, want to ask. Um, one of them actually might be speaking to this exact point, Dean Lynch, um, which is, is it OK to not double major? Um, you know, it, I think that people have uh, a lot of there might be pressure for students to major and minor and do all these things. I'm wondering what advice you might give to someone who thinks that they might just do one major and that's it. I, I think that is absolutely fine. I don't think, you know, double majoring or major and then doing multiple minors, um, they don't necessarily translate into any more, any less success than if you don't. So really just allow your student to explore what they're deeply passionate about and maximize that growth opportunity mm -hmm. without necessarily trying to overthink about by double majoring, I'm going to have a better job that's positioned me for mm -hmm. this opportunity. Don't overthink it. I think it does a disservice to allowing a student to grow to the maximum potential that they have. Um, and it is very, very okay uh, to just do a single major and partake in other things, maybe internships, uh, do team sports uh, in the academic realm. Uh, there's so much to do here. Everybody's going to craft their own journey, mm. um, but align that journey with your interests. And I think that's how students set themselves up for long-term success, not just here at Duke, uh, this is just the first point of a very long journey professionally, but through their entire professional lives, as well as their lives as people in our society. Um, mm -hmm. Just really not to overthink it. Dean Benson, Ed. Yeah, I, I would just I would just argue on the Trinity side. Um, there, people will often overestimate the number of double majors we have. It's only about 20, 20, 22 percent of our students double major. Uh, it's true that many of our students will combine a major with a certificate or with a minor, um, but 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 that's that's a, a a much less intensive undertaking. And I completely agree. Our data don't suggest that double majors uh, do better um, in, uh, for career seeking or for graduate school admissions. Uh, I, I think it's a, it's a reasonable direction if a student is really passionate about a couple of areas or can see the junction of two different areas to pursue a double major. Um, but, but this is a time actually, I think, I, I often tell our students like, don't apply a high school mentality to your college experience. That is, don't see college as the accumulation of a, of a number of, of, of achievements. Um, that, that, that kind of approach I think can lead students not to take full advantage of, of the place, mm. being able to take a major, a minor, do a couple of really great internships, do an, a research experience when you're ready. I think we've seen that's a time tested approach here. Okay. Dean Bennett, you just said the word internship, which sparks a number of questions I'm seeing pop up uh, in the chat. Um, questions about how each of your respective schools uh, perhaps um, support students in their pursuit of, of jobs afterwards. Um, but also perhaps maybe what they do on the ground in real time through mentorship and getting alums engaged perhaps in in conversation like with with students. Um, can you reflect a little bit about maybe both sides of that coin? <clears throat> yeah, maybe I'll get us started there. Um, you know, I, I think our our career center is is as good as it's ever been. Um, the leader there, uh, Greg Victory, has been doing a brilliant job engaging um, both with faculty and uh, and with employers on on all manner of things, both internship uh, related and and first job or related as well. Um, you know, it is it is true that there are some areas that um, uh, some areas and some sectors in which 
early internship seeking may be may, may set a student up for success. Uh, and so we encourage students to engage with the Career Center around this time of their, in their first year, you know, mm -hmm. not, not, not the moment they get here, but after after a little bit of time. And you see the engagement with the Career Center as, as iterative. So it is not a single conversation, but it's a, a repeated series of conversations as students begin to clarify their interests. And they do the work of engaging often in informational interviews frequently with our, our alums. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the things I often recommend for students as a bit of a pro tip, and they'll hear this advice also through the Career Center, uh, is that our alumni network is is really really extraordinary. Um, you know, just just by way of example, we had alums running around here for for many of our events last week, um, not related to their reunions, but just here because there were exciting things happening with our undergraduates. Like our, our alums want to be in to support our undergrads, and I often recommend um, that students seek informational interviews with our alums as they're beginning clar to clarify their their career interests. Um, those kinds of things, in addition to some of the co-curricular programs, I think are are the ways for students to begin to to sort out some of the, those career interests. Yeah, I'll just add on top of that, in addition to the Career Center in the School of Engineering, we also have a Business and Industry Engagement Center. And they're also really great at matching students with alumni to serve as mentors and to actually help students find those internship opportunities, many of which are originating from those alumni in that network, but not necessarily. They may have other connections and know of other opportunities that they can expand uh, the offerings to even go beyond our alumni network, but to seek that out. Um, I would also say faculty can play a very important role in helping students mm -hmm. identify internships. And there are differences between an advisor and a mentor. So all of our students are provided with advisors that will guide their decision-making on which courses to take, maybe internship opportunities, do research through Moose or other programs. But I think it's even more important that students find faculty that just align with their interests and there's good chemistry there to be their mentors. And to not be afraid to engage those faculty and ask them for some help and try and identify some leads on industry opportunities that are going to convert into internship opportunities in the summer or even during the semester. Um, so students really should take full advantage of that alumni network. Um, it's or sorry, the faculty network that we have here to find those opportunities, but some of that may be based on the student approaching faculty and trying to draw out those opportunities. That's super helpful. We had a couple of questions about advising as as well, and I encourage just to, by, for for means of time uh, for folks to uh, look into both. There's plenty of information that you can find online about the different layers of advising in both of the schools. Um, it's not just one advisor for life. There are multiple layers of advising, um, kind of layer upon layer for for uh, students to to engage. Uh, one question for you, this this might be just for you, uh, Dean Bennett, which is um, a little bit more about the arts. I don't want to limit it exclusively to uh, uh, to Trinity, but it seems a little bit more aligned. Just wondering about uh, students and, and the types of art opportunities that are available, um, perhaps both um, both academically, uh, but also um, the opportunities to engage um, co-curricularly. Oh, I'm really glad you framed the question that way, uh, Ben, because uh, the, because both exist um, in in ways that I think are very exciting for our students. Let me just start by saying uh, the the show Rent just finished a run, uh, and so this is uh, we did you know did the musical here. It was led by or they are led by a faculty member uh, who has years of Broadway experience uh, and now teaches in our theater studies department. Uh, but but the performers were our students. And, and the most incredible thing about the student performers is that most of them are not uh, folks who are majoring in the arts or who you know aspire to careers in this space. They're just kids with a lot of talent. And um, and so it, I think that perfectly tells the story of the arts at Duke. We, relative to our peers, we have a significant number of students who are engaged in, in the arts in a, in a variety of ways. Um, and many students choose to engage in one of our extracurricular groups. So maybe a dance club or, or a dance club that's aligned with uh, a certain uh, uh, sort of cultural background, um, or you know, uh, uh, a club where they're you know, maybe in the pep band, right? There are a whole manner of, of, of uh, all manner of, of extracurricular opportunities in the arts. But the thing I think I often encourage our students to, to make sure they, they pursue are our our arts courses. We have one of the most uh, incredible faculty in the arts. And um, and I think, you know, it's it's one thing to be on, on a dance team, which I suggest everyone do. Uh, my 
my wife did was on dance team for a long, long time uh, here. Uh, but you know, it's also the case that you should take a class from in our dance department from a world's leading expert in choreography. I happen to I'm, I'm we're interviewing for new dance faculty right now, and I promise you, I know nothing about dance scholarship, but I am learning all kinds of things about the riches, the scholarly and sort of intellectual richness of those spaces. So I'm, I encourage all of our students to do that. Um, one place I'd point to really right now is our theater studies department. We brought on about four or five new faculty in just the last two years. And these are people who sit at the interface of, of scholarship and practice. And taking a class from one of these folks, um, they teach classes on everything from how to put together a musical, but also how to present oneself in, in front of video uh, and it, like in front of a video camera, just like this, I should probably go take the class. And um, these are skills that aren't just useful for, for performance, but also just skills that will be useful in the new world in which our students are, are engaging. So, um, so thanks for that. And I think it's one of the greatest opportunities here. It's great. Um, one question that we were getting uh, a lot of questions about or one area that we're getting a lot of questions about is really kind of um, course uh, selection, perhaps in some of those first few years of introductory courses that fill up pretty quickly. Um, perhaps some of them are filled up because they're a required stepping stone and perhaps others of them are simply because first year students may not have that access to those higher level courses just yet. I'm wondering if you have any advice for someone or, or any thoughts on um, creating more space for courses at the beginning of those that that academic career or thoughts on that or advice for parents yeah for our engineering students it's um you know the, all of our incoming students will be paired with an assistant dean uh our undergraduate program and will help students navigate some of those questions um in engineering, because we do have an accredited program, there are a number of required courses. We probably have a little bit less flexibility uh, than maybe other disciplines, but it's not to say we have no flexibility. Uh, but I think it's a question of working with those assistant deans very closely to strategize how do you cover those prerequisite courses that are required to move on to the upper level engineering courses but have ample space to explore. And every student's gonna be different. Some students are coming to Duke with a lot of credits that they might've accrued in high school. Some may not, but those assistant deans can tailor that flexibility to the student, meet the student where they are and align that experience so that it meets their goals and their aspirations. But for me, it's really working with those assistant deans at the very beginning to get off on the right foot and be on the right trajectory. Agreed. I, I agree. And, and I, I just want to underscore a point that you, you mentioned a moment ago, Ben, which is that um, we have advisors of many, many types uh, at Duke. It's also a navigational challenge, I think, sometimes for our students to find how find which advisor to go to at the right time. Um, but we have many and you should certainly students should certainly start with their college advisor, uh, but they make they could talk to uh, an associate dean or an, on the Trinity side, an academic dean. Um, and we have a host of, of, of advisors to whom students can turn for, for questions. In the case of registration, you know, I think for a first year student, it's often the case that, that some of the challenges entering those courses have to do with registration priorities. And, um, uh, and we do that for, for a host of reasons. Um, uh, I'm happy to discuss if you want to get more granular, but I, but I'd say that you know we prize the ability for students to engage closely with their faculty members in small courses. That is who that's who we are as an institution. Um, you know, we have, most of our classes are reasonably reasonably small, and I'd say that um, for our first year students, if they're experiencing a little a little frustration or a little anxiety about about getting into courses, I often tell them um, that over the you know, the next two to three years, we have very few students who can't ultimately get in the courses in which they're interested. Um, but sometimes um, it, may, it may take uh, another semester or two, and much of that is designed to prize the, the experience of, of being in a small course and having a close tie with the faculty member. That's great. Thanks for answering those questions. One uh, one question that we've seen a couple times um, too is uh, so Duke has a number of different voices on campus and a lot of different opinions and experiences coming to campus. I'm wondering how you think uh, or or your thoughts on um, Duke's position on, on freedom of speech and how we are are protecting that here um, and advancing it as a university. You want to take a stab at that first, Gary? Yeah, I'd say as a university, one of our foremost values is uh, is truth, and mm -hmm. uh, and we aspire to to 
find truth in, in both in our research, uh, in our scholarly undertakings, and in the discourse that occurs in our, in our classrooms. And as a very, as a very practical manner, um, we are an institution that invites students to share their perspectives. Um, and, uh, and importantly, and I think what will be more important uh, with this generation moving forward, teaching them the skills for how to do that work. I'll note that our kids have grown up in a world where from their very earliest days, and I'll note, unlike many of us, um, they have uh, been, uh, they have been espoused, they espoused the, the values of, of tolerance, of, uh, of community, of belonging, of uh, inclusion. They've heard these things from us from the very beginning. And, and our experience of them in the classroom often is uh, that they, they don't like to offend, right? And it's because we've been telling them from the time that they were two and three um, that, they should, uh, that they should avoid offense at all costs. Um, as they get into our classrooms, we have to really equip them with the skills for how to be able to have constructive discourse across areas of discourse. Um, and I think that's particularly true in this in this time of, of, of considerable polarization. Um, but I'll tell you that we we are interested in our students having those debates and having those discourse, discourse that kind of discourse in ways um, that are productive and that are generative and that ultimately are in the service of us finding answers that will help us to contend with these, these rather significant social challenges. Yeah, I don't really have much more to add there, but I agree it's truth. But our second uh, value is respect. And it's really about respecting other views, even if you don't like those views, um, is being, you know, holding true to truth and respect. Here. Here. Um, I've got a very interesting question, um, and I might take a couple more after this. Uh, what advice do you have for introverted students? Um, Duke can be a, such a place of high energy and outgoing and, and, and effusive energy in some some ways, but I'm wondering what advice that you might have for those who are a little more introverted. My advice would be is to really challenge oneself uh, to really get involved, even though one may lean toward being introverted is, is recognizing that and, and really working at trying to ensure that being introverted doesn't limit options for you to get involved and to grow and to socialize with other students. So really uh, just being very thoughtful about trying to be very sort of forward looking toward engaging other students, the faculty, uh, we're all peers here. Uh, there's a high level of respect across campus, but it's not very hierarchical per se. And students should feel welcome uh, to engage and to really try to grow in that regard if they're introverted here on this campus where it is very protected and it is a moment uh, for that growth. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, you know, I, I, I just add to that that I, uh, you know, as, as father of an introvert, um, probably introverted myself some days of the week, uh, the, um, but, but I think this is a moment where uh, where folks who are introverts can 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 find their people in ways that perhaps was not the case a generation ago, um, and I often encourage that you know in, in social encounters to make your Duke smaller. Um, look, find your people um, in uh, in clubs uh, and in activities where you can you can try to make the experience socially um, uh, again smaller. Um, find your people that way, um, and uh, and if. Students experience challenges doing that. Again, there are a host of, of folks around here who can be of assistance. We have advisors in a number of our units who um, have have their own little specialties in this space. So I would I would encourage disclosure of one's introverted says and and ask people for advice. I'll tell you, faculty are not the most intro, extroverted people in the world. And um, one of the real pro tips for introverts is to go engage a faculty member in office hours. Um, go go find your people that way. Um, take a faculty member out for lunch. That that I know seems like something that may may call on more extroverted um, skill sets, but it's but it's not really. I, I tell most of our introverted students invite a faculty member out for for lunch, and then I want you to just go into that lunch and and prepare a list of three questions. The first question is what's exciting you these days, and then pretty in most cases you don't have to say anything for the rest of the hour. The faculty member is going to take is going to take the time and just keep it moving. So, you know, I think that my, my, my strongest suggestion is this is a time when people can talk about, about uh, their introversion and, and, and learn from people who've been able to navigate this, this previously. I think this is, a, this, is a, this is a good moment to have those conversations. And go to so, as many uh, basketball yeah. games as you can. You will become very <laughs> introverted after you're going to yeah. get yeah. root for Duke. That's great. Paint yourself blue, you know. There you uh, go. Yeah. <laughs> um, 
there's a there's a, a comment here, um, and and I can phrase it as a, a bit of a question. But um, so the class of 2023 and class of 2024 probably had the most unique um, experience uh, in 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 modern history of of um, experiencing COVID and experiencing Duke through COVID. I'm wondering if there are um, advice that you might give those parents as they navigate. Um, uh, uh, mentor, living into that relationship as a parent does in, in 21, 22, where it's morphed from being a parent to more of perhaps a coach, always a parent, but perhaps takes on a different and unique role. What advice might you have for them as they're coming out of COVID um, and kind of going into the workforce and into the new chapter of life, having experienced COVID at Duke? I think resilience is a muscle. And um, and there's no question in my mind that that students in 23 and 24 had enormous challenges. Um, at the population level, our data suggests they're they're doing pretty well right now, and um, that doesn't mean they're not there without challenge at the individual level. Um, but the data suggests they're doing pretty well, and that should not be surprising to us. That, that, that it's often the case that some, that our students who've had challenges not unlike these um, can often develop over time uh, a set a set of skills that helps them to be resilient against against challenges moving forward. Now, I my one of the one of the biggest challenges that we're 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 seeing with them is though is that they have learned a style of interacting. Um, with you know often online and, and with hybrid they've become very comfortable interacting in the ways that we are we are now and the shift back to in person and particularly as many first employers are shifting their contexts away from remote work and away from hybridity and towards more in-person engagements that shift can be can be a real challenge uh, i don't i don't have a, a good answer other than the one that you just gave ben which is to continue to support and encourage uh, students to to uh, push themselves in these in these new directions. And most of our data would suggest they're they're they'll, they'll be okay. They'll be okay over time. Doesn't mean it will be easy. Uh, doesn't mean it will be straightforward. It doesn't mean that their walk is going to be uh, is is going to be the same as the students who came before or after them. Um, but but our experience thus far, when we when we see them, they're they're there's reason for hope. Yeah, and I, I would also just add that, you know, in light of what uh, Dean Bennett just said, where, you know, there's a lot more flexibility provided to our students to acquire information, much of which can be online. Um, be as present and as in person as you can here. Uh, University has gone through great efforts to ensure that the campus community is safe, uh, even as we're in the, the late stages of the pandemic. Uh, Get involved. Uh, don't socially distance, if you will. Yes, you can consume information online and live in a remote world, uh, but the whole point of coming to a place like Duke is to fully immerse in it in person. Um, there's no substitute for that. So encourage students to be consumers of the in-person experience to the maximum extent possible. It's a really good point because one of the things we, we're, we're seeing is that you know so many of our students are, are, are choosing. I think this is both a pandemic effect. It's also just a generational effect of having grown up with with devices. They students would be much, are much more interested in engaging with their advisors and with with other folks via Zoom um, and and FaceTime and those kinds of modes. Um, and you know, look, if we learned anything from the from the pandemic, it's the value of a residential college experience. There is something very special that happens when people are in proximity with one another and when our students are in close proximity to us. I'll often encourage our students to, by saying like. Convenience is 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 an important feature of many parts of your life. Uh, that's not really a, an important feature of, of an academic experience. The long walk from east to west is one that's designed to promote reflection. In addition, <laughs> and if anything else, it's like there is there is a reason for the fact that we ask you to come to office hours in person and to sit with us in that in that space. Um, the, this is this is convenience can can wait a little bit for for right now. Like the the experience of being and being in community is one that that we we know to be uh, important for students' development. Let me ask you one quick question as we wrap up. Um, what gives you hope about Duke students? I definitely will say I they're so idealistic. Uh, they're so positive about, you know, having that ability to go out and actually make the world a better place. I know it's a, you know, a tagline a lot of people use. We use it all the time, but I think it's really true. I, I think the students come here with this real hope that they can be change makers. And the world has got a lot of problems. Uh, we're going through a tough time as a country, as a global community. 
just seeing that unbridled enthusiasm to be change agents, that is uplifting. That is inspirational. Uh, so that would be what it is for me. Here, here. Mine's mine's so very similar. These students are absolutely brilliant. Like they are, they are really a lot smarter than most of us. And um, they give me a lot of hope. You know, if 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 we can. You know, I think a lot of our students come in as these unbelievable intellectual beings, and they are extremely, extremely idealistic in the ways that Jerry described. And if we can help them to learn how to channel uh, their intellects and their idealism into action, then I have I have a lot of hope that the future of our country and the future of our globe will be uh, in a really good place because they are they're just really astounding. And so it's easy to devote with one's life to to um, to their uplift because they're 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 we need them, and I think they'll they're going to be there for us. Awesome. Well, Dean Bennett and Dean Lynch, this uh, this hour went by quickly, um, and, but I am so grateful, and I think I speak on behalf of the parents and families that have joined us. They're so grateful for your insight, for your wisdom, uh, but most of all, for your leadership at Duke. And so thank you for the ways that you continue to shape this great place and, and create a future generation that gives us hope. Um, so we're grateful for all of that. Uh, to the parents and families that have joined us, just a reminder that we will post this to our YouTube page um, as soon as we can. It typically takes about a week in order to get the captions up so that it's accessible to all persons, um, but we will do that um, within the week. Um, this wraps up our series for the spring semester, so thank you for joining us from the previous ones, but also this one as well. Um, we wish you, your students, um, and your family a successful end of the academic year and a informative and prosperous summer. So thanks okay. for all you do, um, and we will see you all next year. Thanks, everyone. Yeah, good Duke. Good Duke.